Are we on yet? Hey, everybody, it's Darcy from the PurposefulPantry.com, and welcome back to the last night of Dry Simber, our live chat event where we're going to be talking about dehydrating, dehydrating, and probably a little bit more dehydrating as we go through the evening. I want to thank you all for being here. I'm so excited that you're here to chat dehydrating because that's not a huge topic that a lot of people talk about, but we're here to make it the coolest thing ever. So before we get started, a couple of things. I want to thank Lisa from Sutton's Days Home. Uh, from Sutton's Days Home. Why did I say that? Lisa from Sutton's Days. I'm thinking about her home because she just did this fantastic kitchen tour of her brand new kitchen on her channel today. Um, but I want to thank Lisa for being here to be my moderator for the evening. It's uh, great to have a friend helping out because this is my very first live chat of my own. And I'm kind of excited and nervous at the same time. And two, if you hear uh, rain, storms and everything, it's about to start storming like crazy at our house. Um, it is in the 40s, uh, raining like mad, and I'm freezing. So you might hear that in the background because that's just the way that's that's happening here. So are you ready to get started talking about dehydrating? Um, I'm looking at the chat and just want to welcome you all here. Um, and happy New Year's Eve to everybody. Um, I'm glad to have you here. So to let's, let's get this started by um, tell me what your dehydrating resolution for 2021 might be. For me, it's going to be be more consistent uh, to do things for our family, not just for the blog, but things that we're actually using and trying to move through. And two, to be more consistent to do it, um, just to make sure that I've always got stuff going in all the time. Um, I have actually gone for almost three weeks, I think now. No, maybe not quite that many without my dehydrator running for much of anything since the cranberry since a cranberry episode. So it's been a little while, so I'm ready. So I'd love to see what all you might be doing for the new year. Oh, Kathy, that's great that you're going to get a new dehydrator. That's awesome. Do you know what kind you're going to get? Um, oh, thanks, Laurie. I appreciate that. Um, Grow more vegetables in the garden, Sherry. That's always a great idea. We're hoping to be able to do that this year too. We had our garden up this year and got some out of it. And then we got hit with uh, the heat and it just pretty much killed everything that we had. Although yesterday I went out to go uh, to go put some coffee grounds and some potato peels on my herb garden. Well, what would be my herb garden, but to, to try to turn it in. Um, and I still had sage and oregano growing that I hadn't noticed because I hadn't been out there in a little while. So I was excited about that. So to utilize your dehydrator and venture into meat, Garcia family, that's awesome. And like I said earlier in the questions above, go to jerkyholic.com. They are the best place to be for jerky. Um, I don't even try to compete with that because I don't have that knowledge, uh, that kind of widespread knowledge they do. That's the place you need to go. Celery, Katie, that's great because celery is so easy to do and that's awesome. Uh, happy Nana, making more meals. That's really cool. So are you wanting to do meals in a jar or are you wanting to do full meals like for hiking and camping that you would keep in the freezer? Which one would you be doing? All right. Learn all the things, Susie. That's great. Hey, Mandy. Hi. Okay. So to get us started, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit um, about whatever you want to talk about. It's kind of odd doing this video when I'm not like talking about a certain thing like I've been doing all month. But for those of you who haven't been part of Dry Simber for the entire month, the playlist is down in the description box below that you can catch up on all of all 30 days of dehydrating. They have been chats from uh, the basics of learning de to dehydrate and all of the kind of questions that I get asked most often so that you can always find any question that you have and get an answer there. And today we're going to concentrate a lot on just whatever questions you have um, and anything that you'd like to talk about as far as dehydrating goes. And for those of you who don't know or haven't, or have gotten it, who don't know, <laughs> um, this whole month um, has been, is now available as an ebook that you can get in my shop. I've got the description down below. I mean, I've got the link in the description box down below. Um, I did a book that is basically the entire series available for you that way. So here's what it look like, looks like. Uh, if I can get out of that, the Dehydrating Basics book, the facts, tips and tricks, all that we've talked about all month long, it's $3 through tomorrow. Um, and uh, it's 35 pages of dehydrating. That's all it's about. So it's available today. And for those of you who have asked about it, um, I've had quite a few questions. I went today and had it printed off. So this is the what, what uh, the glare. This is how I did it. 
Um, it just basically, I had one cover done in color. Then I had the rest of it done in black and white. So it cut down on the price. I had it done on front and back pages. So it reads just like a book instead of only on the front page. Um, and this cost with the comb binding and having um, the plastic cover on either side of it to protect it um, was about $10 at my local stables. However, if you don't do the comb binding and you don't do the, um, the plastic covers, the print price was about $5 to do the same color cover and then black and white for the rest of it. So it really wasn't uh, I was surprised at how little it was going to cost to print off in case you ever wanted to do that as well. For those of you who brought it already. So let's go with some questions. Um, we were talking earlier yesterday uh, in the video that I did about um, no, two days ago about um, how to rehydrate. And I posted photos of me rehydrating that product in, um, in a meal on the dehydrating groups try that again, the dehydrating tips and tricks group. I posted photos of the dinner that night. Um, and I've also got it on my Instagram. If you're not on Facebook, if you go to Instagram, the purposeful pantry, um, I've posted those photos too, about how I took those vegetables that I had soaked in the refrigerator and incorporated them into a meal that night. So, um, that seems to be one of the questions people have the most often about rehydrating, about using dehydrated goods is how to rehydrate. So, like I said that day, there are three ways you can uh, cold soak it in your refrigerator for overnight or five or six hours, and those vegetables will absorb water. Um, I don't know if you noticed in the video where um, I had put the water in and it was sitting quite a bit up over the the line of the vegetables, it had soaked most of that water up. I had very little that I had to actually put into the potatoes later. Um, you can do a hot soak, which is 30 minutes or so beforehand. You would throw um, your vegetables into either a simmering pot on their own on the stove or pour hot boiling water over the top of them and give them a good 20 to 45 minutes, depending on what they are. And that's how you would get them to rehydrated, ready to go into a meal. And the last way that you can do it is actually take taking those vegetables and throwing them into your soup or your stew and giving them plenty of time to simmer while they're cooking. Now, the question that comes up most often is, is that when you rehydrate it, you didn't like it because it was still hard. That comes from the fact that it's going to rehydrate to the state that it was before you dehydrated it. So if they weren't cooked yet, they need to still cook. So you need to make sure that you give those vegetables plenty of time to cook after you're rehydrating them so that they come to the texture that you're expecting them to have. So I hope that helps. All right. So let me check for questions real quick. Um, let's see. Um, Cindy, yeah, you have um, several ten, number 10 cans of vegetables and can you dehydrate dehydrate them? Yes, you can. Um, the texture may not be like what you expect it to be because they've already been so heavily processed between the canning um, and being in the water all the time, but you're welcome. You can do that. I wouldn't, however, eat them on their own. They would be something that you would want to throw into a meal because the texture to eat by themselves is not necessarily going to be the best. And it's also a personal preference, but they're best to be used in something else. And how I use them the most is at that point, I would make them into a vegetable powder because that becomes more accessible for the nutrients to go into that than if you had, um, than if you were just trying to add them to something else, because then you can add them to anything. Um, oh, thanks, Lisa. I see that. Um, how do I size broccoli to dehydrate? Um, I'm not sure who had that question. Um, sizing a broccoli will be that you want florets to be done the size of the bite that you would want to have them if you were already going to eat them. So you don't want to de dehydrate a large chunk of broccoli. You're going to want to cut it up to the size that you would normally cut it to eat. If you're doing the stalk, you would want to slice it into thin slivers, not, not, not super thin, but coins. You don't want to try to dehydrate large chunks of, of broccoli because they won't rehydrate well. You need to blanch them all before you dehydrate them to save that color and save the vitamins. You, if you don't, what's going to happen is that over time, that broccoli will start turning brown in your jars. So that would help. Okay. Let's see. What other questions do we have? Um, boo, boo tube, a thumbs up is going to have to be, you're going to have to open up your video into the full screen instead of just seeing the, the, the screen like it is, um, on a phone, you typically have to open up a little bit more. 
Let's see. Teresa, the broccoli was for you. See, I see that now. Okay, William Fleming um, asked if there's a difference between oxygen absorbers and a vacuum sealer. Okay, oxygen absorbers only remove oxygen out of the environment. Okay, a vacuum sealer removes probably 98 to 99% of all air out of that environment. It never does create a true vacuum because we don't have the ability to do that at home. Um, if you use a brake bleeder instead of a vacuum sealer, you will get a little bit more out of that because the, va the brake bleeder can actually pull more. Um, the draw on it is greater than most vacuum sealers. So an O2 absorber doesn't require any kind of mechanism at all. You throw one into to the container that you're wanting to vacuum seal. It's a sort of vacuum seal. And it will, it will absorb that oxygen out of that environment, still leaving the moisture, still leaving everything else. And you need that moisture for the oxygen absorber to work. So putting an O2 absorber doesn't require any kind of mechanism at all. If you're going to go to vacuum sealing, you need a vacuum sealer. Um, if you're going to vacuum seal jars, you need the jar attachments. And then you also need to either use the vacuum sealer to do that, or you can use a brake bleeder instead. So that's the difference between the two. What I recommend is if you're going to be doing really long-term storage for more than a year, um, and if you're using Mylar bags, you need to use the O2 absorber. If you're doing short-term storage, you don't need either. You don't need to do any of that because it's not necessary as long as you've properly, and everybody say this with me who's been with me for a while, as long as you've properly dried, conditioned, and put in airtight storage, you really don't need anything else. Um, but I prefer vacuum sealing. It's non-wasteful. I don't have to have an O2 absorber that I chuck at the end. Um, I can easily open the jar, take stuff out to refill my daily use jars, and then just vacuum seal up again and put it back on the shelf. I just prefer that. But I also don't use Mylar. If I'm using Mylar, you'd have to use an O2 absorber. Does that answer your question? I hope that does. All right. Hey, Erica, glad to see you here. Um, Cynthia, I hope that helps because that makes it handy. Um, for some people, they just prefer to have the print over an ebook because it just makes it easier for them. All right, let's see. Do we have other questions? Or um, Melissa asked if I can use a brake bleeder that's been used to, bre to uh, bleed brakes already, or do you need a new one? I would use a new one, Melissa. You don't ever really want to cross that with food, just like you don't want to use the moisture absorbers that have been put into pill bottles or that have been used in like sneakers or purses, those kind that you get. Um, those are probably not food grade um, and you don't know how good they actually are. So you don't want to put those into the foods that you already have. And I really wouldn't use a brake bleeder just in case there is any kind of cross. However, you know, that's your choice. Um, there is no way to refresh an oxygen absorber. They are one and done. You use them once, you open that jar back up or the bag that you have them in, they have been used, you have to replace them. Moisture absorbers can be recharged by simply putting them on a cookie sheet into a hot oven of about 200, letting them sit there for 30, 40, 50 minutes, maybe two hours, depending on how much time you have. And if you paid attention to them, they can also be put in your dehydrator and run for an hour or two to recharge as well. But that's also food grade only. You don't want to use non-food grade moisture absorbers for your dehydrated goods. Um, let's see. Janet, when using an electric pressure cooker, what's the proper way to use vegetables that were dehydrated from raw? Um, Janet, I would think you would just throw it in with enough water to take care of them and then just pressure cook it. I mean, it's going to have plenty of time to cook them. They're going to rehydrate in that liquid while they're being pressure cooked. Um, just make sure that you've given yourself that extra liquid if you need it, uh, depending on how giving that recipe is. Nancy, yes, you'll get probably overall, you'll get less breakage of your seal, less fail failure of a vacuum seal with a brake bleeder because it does do a better draw than most, especially most inexpensive vacuum sealers. Um, as much as I love my handheld vacuum sealer, I don't use it for super long-term storage because I know that those seals are not as effective as if I use my full-size vacuum sealer. Um, and I don't use my brake bleeder, bleeder a lot now. I just recently got it this summer. Um, and for those of us who might have some grip issues, using a brake bleeder can be a little hard, but it does work. All right. 
Oh, Melissa, the brake leader. Um, let me see. Let me hold on just one second. Do I have it handy? Hey, Aiden. Do you mind going to my storage over there and getting one of those jar food sealer attachment things for me? Uh, there in the entryway. Sure. Thanks. All right, Melissa, I'm going to show you how it works real quick. Oh no, I'm not. Where is it? <laughs> I don't want my handy dandy storage. I don't have it right here. Never mind, Aiden. I don't have it handy enough. Okay, Melissa, sorry. I'm back. Um, basically, what happens when you use a brake bleeder on a jar, you have the jar attachment that goes on the top of it. And then you take the hose from the brake bleeder and put it right into the, the opening. And you just sit there and squeeze. And what's happening is it's pulling all the air out, just like you would pull it out if you're using the brake bleeder on the brakes. I mean, it's just basically, you're just sucking all the air out of it and it forms a seal on that lid, just like if you used a vacuum sealer. So the reason why I'm not suggesting using it is because you might have whatever residual oils that you're putting into the jar that while it's all coming out and not necessarily going in, you just don't really want to put automotive products in with your food. We don't want to do that. Okay. Let's see. Is it okay to put your product in the, your powder product in the oven to get the dampness from powdering drying out. Actually, uh, Cynthia, that is what you should be doing. What that is, is basically called conditioning um, your powders. What you're doing is the same is, is a form of conditioning. So once you've dehydrated all your products, you're going to then condition them before you do anything else with them to make sure that they're fully dry. Um, if you're very if you're very experienced in what they should look like and what they sound like, you don't necessarily have to condition before powdering, but when you're beginning, you should so that you can make sure everything is fully dry and ready to go. Once you powder it, when it's in that, in that grinder, you're creating moisture from the heat and you're also causing all of those sugars that are in the food, whether it's a fruit or a vegetable, because your vegetables still have sugars in them. You're creating, um, getting all of those sugars excited and they expand and they cause clumping. And the, also the moisture from the heat, um, that creates in the air will cause things to clump as well. So the best thing to do is once you're finished powdering, then you should lay them out on, on cookie sheets for your oven. What I do is turn it to 200, let it heat up, and then I turn it off, throw those things into the oven and let them dry for about, I usually give them a good 30 to 45 minutes. But you can also do that in your dehydrator if you use a, um, a coffee filter, um, or you can put it in a bowl with a lid over it, or if you put an put them on your sheets. You can lay a sheet on top of it, but if they're in your dehydrator is um, make sure that you make, turn it off and make sure all the fans come to a complete stop before you open that door or you're going to have powder everywhere. All right. The next question. Let me catch them. Oh, Lisa, thanks for those links. That's awesome. All right. And you're very welcome for dry simber guys. I was so happy to do it for you. Um, it was a big undertaking, but it was like all these questions get asked all the time. And I want to be able to just send people straight to those answers and help people learn the basics because this was a year. A lot of people bought dehydrators, especially this spring when we had all the shutdowns, people were really trying to learn how to use them and just kind of jumping into it and not knowing why their foods were failing or why they didn't like what they made. So I wanted to make sure that you had all of those questions answered about all the things that happen with dehydrating. It's really so easy to do, but people can get uh, make it complicated or just not know what the next steps are. So I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Okay, let's see. Can this thrive? Garcia, what can asking what can thrive? Um, let's see. I'm trying to. Um, happy Nana jars are so pretty. Can they be displayed? Um, it, it is best to keep them in a cool, dark place, just like with every other product that you're storing. Um, I don't know if you can see, can you see here? I have, I'm going to tilt this a little bit. There is my working kind of, uh, my, what I use a lot for my props for my blog that when I've worked through some of the products that I'm doing, that I'll keep them there and they're fine. They just won't have as long of a shelf life on those shelves is if I kept them in my pantry when they're dark, which is where most of my other dehydrated goods are stored. Um, I might keep them back in the back corner. So they stay, they stay dark because light water uh, and um, air are the three things that can make your dehydrated goods uh, degrade really quickly. So yes, you can display them if you'd like, but make sure those are the things that you're going to be using through pretty quickly. If you expect them for long-term storage, I would store them away 
in the in the best place for them. Hey, Country Horny, welcome here. Hey, MMC Crafts, this is my first live event too. Welcome, we're buds. Um, Mandy, I don't have a canister, so I haven't used one. Um, I I did something stupid when I bought my first food saver a thousand years ago. It came with canisters, and that was before I was um, doing vacuum sealing with my dehydrated stuff. And it was like it was even before I started dehydrating. I mean, it was years and years ago. I had these canisters that were used for marinating, and or in but that's how I assumed the larger ones were. And I didn't see any use for them for me at the time, so I. I got rid of them. I gave them away. And now I could kick myself in the butt because they're so expensive and you can't find them easily. And I know there is a PVC version out there that you can DIY yourself, but um, I've never done a canister vacuum. And I think that would, that would be that. Yeah. Uh, botulism is only going to be a problem if you don't, if you don't dehydrate properly and really within dehydrated goods, it's not that big of a deal. <clears throat> All right. Do you prefer a top motor or a bottom motor on a dehydrator? Susan Baker asked that. Um, Susan, I prefer a top if I'm going to use a stackable machine only because the bottom one is that if things spill on it, depending on how it's made, it can get dirty and it can burn. It can stuff can burn on that motor and it can just become a problem. Um, I know there are some people who like the bottom motors of the old fan of the old dehydrators because they seem to work better. But a lot of those were single single temperature machines, which dehydrated really high. So of course they did well because they're all dehydrating at 150 and above. So um, I would prefer a top one down for me. If I were to buy another stackable, that's what I would do. All right. Charlie, did you get a birthday present? What did you get? Oh, Ellen Joy, that's where you'd have to go. Thrift stores to find those canisters. That's exactly right. God's butterfly. Is it possible to over dehydrate? I want to ensure meals are fully dehydrated. Okay, here's, here's the general rule of thumb. No, it's not possible to over dehydrate. However, Depending on what you're making, yes. If you have fruit leathers, if you have jerky, those you can over dehydrate and they can become too tough to eat in the fact, in the case of jerky or with fruit leathers, they can become so brittle. They're not really fruit leather. They're actually fruit brittle, which for our family, we actually tend to like the brittle better because it, it's, it's easier to eat. But for most things, if you're going to be putting them into something else, you can't over dehydrate as far as the actual drying time. You want everything as dry as possible. However, you can over dry something by temperature. So if you're drying herbs at 165 degrees, you're over drying them and you can over dry them and kind of burn them. If you're doing citrus at 165 degrees and they all get brown and kind of funky, that's over drying. That's because it's too high of a temperature. You haven't actually burned them, but the sugars in them have browned to the point that they've just kind of make them look bad. Citrus should be, while typically fruit should be done at 135, citrus can be done at 125 below to keep that brown, that over browning from happening that can make them not look good. And in fact, if you do them too high, too long, yes, you can kind of burn them. But in general, you can't over dry. So for those of you who want to dry overnight, but you're worried about having something drying at 135 all night that you think that's going to be too much, turn it down to the lowest that your machine can go and then just let it go. That way you don't have to worry about it. All right. Um, is an Excalibur dehydrator for tray okay to start dehydrating? I'm going to tell you, spend your money more wisely and buy a Kasori um, cabinet machine that's about the same price that you get two, I think, two extra trays. And it's a better machine to me than the four tray Excalibur. And here's why I think that. Um, while the surface area may not be quite as large, you get more trays. You're spending about the same amount of money, if even not a little less, um, depending on what you can get a four tray for. Because if you get it from a thrift store or if you're getting it from a discount place, they probably are a little cheaper for the Excalibur four tray. But my thing is, is that it's, it depends on what you need. If you're planning on just doing snacks, you're not really wanting to get too serious about it it's fine because you're not really trying to produce a lot of bulk. If you're planning on doing a lot of bulk to stock your pantry, use that money on a machine that's bigger. Because if you're doing something bulky like spinach or kale, you have to remove one or two of those trays to make room for it. And then you've just lost 
half your machine. So while the four trays are good, and if you can get them on sale, they're even better. Um, if it were me, I would go with a Kasori cabinet style because it just, for the price, is a better price. Um, oh, stock in my pantry. There you go. A new dehydrator just now. So which one did you get? And Angela, you're very welcome. That's what I'm here for. All right, Helen, question. I want to protect vacuum sealer. Do you have to do anything to the cupcake paper before vacuum packing powders? Um, I don't. Oh, I see what you want. Okay. Um, when you're putting, when you're going to vacuum seal powders, which um, Helen, I'm going to ask you really quickly first, or at least if you're vacuum sealing the powder for long term, I would suggest that you don't powder until you need it to keep your stuff full um, keep it whole before you powder because when you powder, um, you're breaking down, you're processing your food even more and you're exposing more of that surface area to light moisture and air. Yeah, light moisture and air, which will help it degrade faster. Typically, powders only last about six to nine months as it is. So um, don't powder to put away for long-term storage because your powders will degrade over time. And it's kind of like with spices when you kind of, if you, uh, smell it and you can't really identify what it is. And if you rub it and still can't, you've, you, it, they're pretty much not good anymore. So if your powder, if you're going to store your powders, store it whole first. If you're going to vacuum seal your powders for that short term, um, you take your cup, your paper cup, and you invert it over your powder before you put your lid on and then you vacuum seal it. That cup should help stop any of the powders from getting up into your vacuum sealer. So I hope that helped. Um, let's see. Question. Oh, we just did that question. Um, Nancy, you're very welcome for all those videos. I'm glad you enjoyed them. Okay, question. Helen, I got that one. Can I dehydrate frozen tomatoes, Carol? Caracottal? Um, yes, you can. But what I'm going to suggest is that you let them thaw first before you dehydrate it. Catch that, that, catch that tomato juice, use it in a soup, use it in a stew, make something else with it. But they're going to release a ton of water, which you don't want in your machine. So your choices are you can puree them and then just dehydrate from there. Um, or you can let them thaw then dehydrate them. Because if you put them on your dehydrating trays, as they thaw, they're just going to make a huge mess in the bottom of your machine. Um, Ron, if you want to freeze dry, um, it's pretty, it's, it's a great way to do things because it's a good preservation method that's actually better for, for your foods. And you can do more whole foods, I mean, whole meals than you can with dehydrating. But you have to look at the cost um, of a two to $3,000 machine, depending on which one you get and how much you're going to benefit from it. For me, I don't do enough that it would benefit me, but freeze drying is an option for you. I'm just not willing to make that kind of investment at this point in my life with what we're doing. All right. Nancy, you can put a clean cloth on the top of the powder before you seal your, you can, Nancy, you can put a clean cloth, but then it stays there. So um, I would use, if you can, a coffee filter or even paper towel, because then you lose that cloth. Um, Helen, that yummy hot chocolate recipe you gave for. Oh, if you want to vacuum seal that, it works the same way as, oh, that's, yeah. Okay. Now I see, I understand what you mean. Um, yeah, you can dehydrate, you can, sorry, you can vacuum seal the, uh, the hot chocolate, um, recipe. That's fine. But I still wouldn't make enough of it to last for a year or two. Um, make it for shorter term and, and use it better that way. But yes, you can vacuum seal that just fine. Um, let's see. And, um, Denise, congratulations on the new Cabela's. It's a great machine. I hope that you can get some benefit out of these, um, videos to help you learn how to use it. Rhonda, thanks so much. I'm glad that you're, you're finding these useful. All right. Question from little, uh, Eli Gardner. I had the Excalibur nine tray. I did parsley for the first time this year. How do you keep it from blowing all over the place? All right. What I do with my herbs, I keep them on their stems, especially not pretty much all of them. Um, stems first and then parsley becomes so light as it dries. You can actually put a, a another like fruit leather sheet on top of it to keep it kind of in place as it is. Um, so, um, 
one sheet on the bottom, one sheet on the top mesh. If you're using mesh, just double your mesh on it. That helps kind of keep them in, in place. Um, some people will actually use a little weight on the edge of theirs to keep the mesh down or their fruit leather sheets or even parchment paper. Um, we'll put some weight down on the parchment paper to keep it from flying around too. Um, but I find just like with everything else, don't turn on your machine and don't uh, until your door is fully on your machine and don't take that door off until your machine is stopped running. That will help a lot of that fly away. All right. Um, loving life. My dehydrated pineapple smells kind of like laundry detergent. And is that normal? It's fine. You're good. Susie, do I need to condition my peach slices after dehydrating before vacuum sealing in a jar? You need to dehydrate. I mean, you need to condition everything before you put it in a jar to be stored everything, all the things, to condition all the things. Because what you have is that conditioning helps two things. It helps overall to make sure that the humidity level in every piece of the fruit or the vegetables that are that you're going to store is about the same. Because what you'll have is that things dry a little differently on your trays, depending on where they are on your tray, if they're on the top or the bottom, in the middle, um, however that works. So they don't necessarily, or, and it also matters about how you've cut them. So you want to make sure that that moisture and the humidity that's left that should be there is evenly distributed amongst all the pieces. The second thing you're trying to catch is if anything doesn't, hasn't been dried enough and it can create a mold problem. So before you put anything, anything away into storage, you need to condition it first, including your peach slices. All right. Let's see. Nope. Hey, Molly. Welcome. Welcome to the chat. You haven't missed it. Um, all right. Karen for beets, um, powder beets I use in either to, uh, to make things red, um, in smoothies. Yes. But you can also add them to brownies. I mean, stick it in stuff that you typically wouldn't think about adding some extra beets to beets go well in pretty much any kind of chocolate meal. Um, I don't have a specific recipe. You can look those up online. Um, but beet powder can be used in a lot of those kind of chocolatey dense colors that they aren't noticed, but you can even put a little bit in a lot of things that you cook normally, like add some to a stew or, um, a, a dark color casserole. Nobody will taste it. It really won't change the color a lot. Um, and it'll just be that little bit of added nutrition. All right. All right. Scrap a, uh, de -do -da. Um, how would you use the food saver canisters if you're vacuum sealing? Um, what you would do is you would take your canister, you would put your jar with the lid on the inside of that canister, close your canister, attach it to your vacuum sealer and vacuum seal away. The vacuum sealer should stop when the vacuum has taken, has been pulled out of um, your jar fully. So it's taken out as much as it's going to take out. When you open it, your food, your jar should have your lid stuck against your, your jar. You put your ring on and you store it. It also works on commercial jars that have uh, one lid, like um, like if you went to buy spaghetti and you have the lids there with a pop button, it will work to vacuum seal those kind of jars, not just the mason seal jar, not the mason jars. Um, however, I'm going to caution you that if you use those commercial jars, don't use them too many times because eventually they will wear out where that seal won't keep. So make sure you're always checking your seals. Don't always put them away. Don't put them away assuming that they're always going to be all right. All right. How long can you continue to add to a jar of dehydrated goods? Uh, oh, how long can you wait before you add more from Janet? All right. If you have, um, I don't have them here because I didn't think to pull them down. This week I did, um, I powdered some vegetable powder for a video. And I already had a jar of vegetable powder that I was using up. And I had this new powder that I could add to it. As long as both products are dry, you can add to them. I wouldn't go six months and start adding two that were that far apart. And if you really want to be safe, you can powder, you can put them both in back into the oven to dry before you add to them. If you're doing goods within um, like solid goods, like your sweet potatoes, um, I would follow that same idea that if you have a large jar that you need to fill up, don't go too many months between them because the first batch has started to degrade just a little bit more than your new batch. Um, and you want to make sure they're all dry and you don't want to introduce new things into an old jar that may not be as well as good. Um, so, you can always take care of that by dehydrating the old one some more too, so that you're safe. Um, but I wouldn't go 
six months. I wouldn't go that long between adding two batches together. I would keep it shorter. Just keep them in two separate jars. All right. Thanks, Susan. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Cookie, I'm so glad that you've enjoyed the videos this month. They've been, they've been awesome to make. Um, is it possible to dry tofu enough to powder? Um, you know, Cynthia, I have never dried tofu. I wish I could answer that. Um, that might be something that you would want to go check with a vegan site. Um, there are quite a few that do that. Um, I wish I could answer that one. That's one that I, I honestly don't know. Um, I would think that you could, I don't know. That's one, that's one you'd have to play with. Try it out. See what you think. Um, Henry, Henry Sunny, do the dehydrated gherkin gummies need to be stored in the fridge? Absolutely not. Um, they are going to stick over time because sugar is very hygroscopic, which means that any moisture in the air, that sugar is going to suck up like crazy. And because those are so full of sugar, they're going to be prone to becoming uh it clumping. Okay. So keeping in the refrigerator over time can help stop that clumping. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, and you can use a moisture absorber in your jar to help maintain that low moisture level for your gummies if you want. Um, but they do not need to be kept in the refrigerator. They're shelf stable. You can just put them on the shelf. All right. I am missing some questions. Jody, I have never made cranberry powder. Um, are you talking about cream? Have I made dried cranberry powder from my cranberries? You're going to have to go for a while. Cranberries take a long while to dry and you want to get them dry good and hard. You don't want to do that kind of soft middle. It's going to take a while, but yes, you can make cranberry powder out of your cranberries. It just takes two, three days. Okay. Um, is there any vegetable that I would not dehydrate, Susan? Um I'm going to say there's probably no vegetable that I wouldn't dehydrate for a tutorial. There are vegetables that I wouldn't bother dehydrating because I'm never going to eat them, whether they're cooked or not, unless I powdered them into a vegetable powder to use. Like there's no chance ever that you're going to get me to dehydrate lima beans for any kind of quick meal ever, because you're never going to get me to eat a lima bean in a million years. Um, there's really no vegetable that I can think of that you shouldn't dehydrate or that I wouldn't. Not at all. All right. Powder. Technically, um, you shouldn't dry cheese. Here's why. The National Center for Home, Foods, Home Food Preservation, which is the safety standard that I follow on my blog and in my dehydrating group, Dehydrating Tips and Tricks, right on Facebook, does not recommend doing dairy of any kind because um, it hasn't been tested to be safe. And there are so many factors that involve with doing cheese and dairy and eggs that they can't account for. So they recommend not doing them. If you're going to do cheese powder, you, what you want to do is get freeze dried cheese and, and then powder it. That's when you, but you can also buy cheese powder. Now, if we get, if we pull away from the safety, which is what I support all the time, practically you can dehydrate cheese. Uh, it will take you quite a while. You need to make sure that you've gotten dabble at it all the time to get the fat out and it needs to be stored in the freezer and people do powder it, but I'm going to tell you it's best just to go ahead and buy the, fr the freeze dried cheese, powder it yourself or buy the previously powdered cheese that you can get online from Hoosier Hill Farms, from Augustine Farms, I think Thrive. Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember. Does Thrive Life have cheese powders? Um, any of those kind of things, um, you can go and just get the powder and be on the safe side. It's not messy. You don't have to store it in the freezer. It's just the best way to do it for me. Um, how would you dehydrate sourdough starter? Mary, um, most purists will just let it dry on its own outside of your machine. You can air dry it between two um, protective layers of paper towels or tea towels or something. If you do it in your dehydrator, you need to have it down on the absolute lowest possible setting below 105 because you don't want to kill all the beneficial bugs in there that make it sourdough. So you just spread it on a, on a sheet. You put it in at 95 or lower if yours does go lower than that um, and just dry it until it's dry and store it in an airtight container. All right. Um, stocking my pantry. Yeah. If you're going to do powder, then, then do, then dehydrating the cooked soybeans and powdering those are probably much better than trying to do tofu, but then I don't eat tofu. So, okay. Let's see. 
Um, Gretchen, what I have available as far as a book for dehydrating is called Dehydrating Basics. It is this book. It's an ebook. It's it that you can print out the ebook. Um, I actually went ahead and had it printed today at Staples so I could see the price for it. And it's about five bucks to get it printed. This is, come on, this is the book right here. It's available on my website in the shop. And I have a link down in the description box below. And Lisa's probably going to link it too. Um, this is it right here. So what this is, is basically the last 30 days of the dry December that I've done. It's all of that into a book format here so that it's all written out for you so that you can print it off if you want or have it on a tablet or your uh, any kind of e-reader that you use. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Let's see. Mandy, okay, there you go. So they have shredded cheese um, and I think somebody just did the head powder. Let's, okay. Laverne Taylor, what kind of um, dehydrator do I recommend? I'm going to drop a link for you in the box uh, in, the, in here because this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this in for you right here. Um, the, the dehydrator that you need to use is based on your budget, your needs, and the space that you have to dry um, because dehydrators can be big if you buy a big one and then if you don't have the space to store it it be can become problematic um your budget is going to really affect what kind of machine you get whether or not you want a stackable machine or a cabinet machine which is either the stack the stacked rings or the cabinet that has the doors in it there are a lot of factors that play into what machine that i would recommend for anyone my favorites by far are in that post that i just linked you to but it's going to be a nesco any excuse me any of the Nesco's, let me get a drink real quick, sorry. Any of the Nesco's are great bargain machines. They're great beginner machines that you're not investing a lot of money in. Um, they are all stackables. And you can go from the 75A, which is the, the circular one that has all the time, the temperatures that you need. The, um, how long has it been since I've said it now? The Square Nesco that I don't remember the number for, that was my very first machine. It is a workhorse. I love that machine. It is solidly built. It's better than the 75A uh, as far as the as the as the each of the trays were. They were more, they were tougher. Um, and then you have the Nesco Garden Master, which is the 80A, I think. It's the one that you can actually expand up to 30 trays. It's about a hundred dollars. Those Nesco's are all great machines. Then you have the Kasori stackable or the Kasori, the cabinet style that is a stainless steel machine. Then you have the Advanco, which is a little bigger stainless steel, but still pretty cheap. Um, the LEMs um, and Excalibur, of course. And I mean, there are some other ones. So it really does depend on your budget. But that that website, uh, the post that I sent you actually breaks it down by the kind of um properties each has and then within the budget so that you know which one that you might want within a budget. I hope that answers your question. I wish I could just tell you to go buy this machine. It's going to work. Um, I am not an Excalibur exclusive person. I happen to use an Excalibur, but I am not uh, one who thinks that that's the exclusive machine that you have to get because it is, uh, it's a great machine. I love my machine. Um, I wouldn't give it up if I could help it, but it's not for everybody. All right. Well, stock in my pantry. Great. I'm glad you like both the books and thank you very much. Um, there we go. Um, let's see. Sherry, for short-term storage of dehydrated veggies, can I use plastic jars with lids like from Peanut so I can save my canning jars for pressure canning? You can, Sherry. For short-term, it's no problem. Just remember that those lids are not airtight all the time. It depends on the maker and the jars themselves. Um, but yes, you can use those for short-term. If you're going to use Peanuts, make sure you clean them out really well because that that can transfer the 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 um the flavor can transfer onto your your dehydrated goods and if you want to continue to use those down the line they actually make these silicone rings on and you can get them on amazon you just have to make sure the sizes that you can use to insert in those kind of plastic lids or other one piece lids like um oh and of course i don't have one handy close by sorry oh here we go so i have one on here i do happen to have one right here on my moisture absorbers um, plastic lids like this that do not have the ring 
you can get these silicone rings that are on Amazon that you can use then to insert into your jar lids. And then it forms that seal that help extend um, that you can make these more airtight. So if you want to keep some of those jars, the commercial jars that might not be necessarily airtight, um, or if you find these one piece plastic lids that you can use on any of the commercial things, that's a way to do it is to, it's to invest in those silicone rings to help create airtight storage. All right, let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, Susan, I'm glad you love your Kasori. I, you know, if if they had been available back when I was buying my first machine, um, I would buy a Kasori. I really like them. Um, Monica Sherman, can I just mix my powders with water and drink? You can. However, what you're going to find is you're going to have all that grit. I'm sorry. Hold on just a second. Getting a little dry mouth from talking. Um, dehydrated powders don't dissolve the way that mixes do from a store. So what you'll have is that you'll find that you have a lot of that grit left at the bottom of your drink um, that you might not like, but that's a, that's that's totally up to you. What people will do is to put those powders into a, a, a fine mesh strainer. <coughs> Sorry, folks. Lisa, now I know what you go through on yours. Um a fine mesh tea strainer that you would make tea with can be a way that you can put those powders into your drink and let it let it flavor your drink without getting the grit inside of it. So I hope that helps. Gretchen, awesome. I hope you enjoy it. It's all of the answers for pretty much anything that anybody asks. Um, okay. Let's see. Do you have any other questions? Well, we got that with the monic with the drinks. I need um, those silicone rings, Molly. If I remember, they were pretty inexpensive. Um, you just have to make sure you get the right diameter for the lids that you're going to do. So I don't just buy them willy nilly. I have them with. Um, I buy some metal one piece lids that I'd like to use because sometimes trying to juggle a mason jar lid um, with my clutchiness, I like the one lids better. So I get those for the for that way. Um, Janice, do I, um, do you know if elderberries are okay to eat if dehydrated uncooked? Um, I, Janice, I'm going to tell you, you got me on another question that I'm not sure about. I've never messed with elderberries other than the ones that I buy commercially. And I know there are some health issues with doing elderberries correctly. Um, so are you a member of my dehydrating group? I'm not sure. I don't remember if I'm sorry that I don't remember. If you are, I will go search that and put it in the dehydrating group um, to make sure because I don't want to say the wrong thing because I know elderberries are one of those things that are kind of iffy on the protection. And if anybody in the chat knows, answer that. Um, I've only ever just bought them commercially because I don't have avail I don't have them available to dehydrate. Um, all right, Monica, there. If you've got the grit and you don't mind, then you know just be aware that there will be grit. Um, you know, Zephy Nation, the Ivations are a lot like the Kasori's as far as that stainless steel machine. Um, I know that sometimes manufacturers can get the same machine from a, a place and then do their own branding on it. Um, but I, I do know I love the Kasori name and I love the, uh, the stuff behind them. Um, how long does it take for your marshmallows to dehydrate? It took mine three days. Um, Laverne sometimes, okay, here's the thing. Time. Um, is different for every machine that you do because machines are all different. The humidity in your home can affect it, how big those marshmallows were, the make of the marshmallows. When I do marshmallows, most of the time, I can have mine done in about six to 10, ten hours at the most. The thing to remember is when you're doing marshmallows to take them off the trays, let them come to a let them come to room temperature and then test them to see if they're done. If you bite into them and they shatter, they're finished. If you still have, when you bite into them, you still have quite a bit of bite in the middle, then you need to dehydrate them more. If you're doing those large ones, they are going to take a day or two or three. Um, the small ones shouldn't take that long. Um, so you might want to make sure that you're testing it when they're cool, not when they're still warm than dehydrator because they will always be soft that way. All right, let's see. Molly, thank you for that, that she's read that you can only consume cooked elderberries. Um, that's the only kind I've ever had. So um, I wish I could remember. 
Um, Zephy Nation, do I like the square circle trays better? I like the square trays better only because you get more on them and you don't have the hole in the middle to deal with and you have more options for tray liners than you do for the circle ones. So I will take a square tray over a circle tray any day. I happen to have one of both. Um, I have an Excalibur and I also have a Nesco um, circle one and I just like the squares better because you get so much more product and I'm all about the bulk. All right, um, let's see. Hey, city girl, country heart. Happy new year to you as well. And you too, Carol. Um, um, Ella, Ellen, there was an immediate um, download for the book. If you didn't see it and you missed it, email me at Darcy at the purposeful pantry.com and I will get you a copy of it. Okay, 10 minute warning, Lisa. Thank you. That's gone by really fast. All right. Um, let's see. Before we end tonight, um, tell me what is your favorite thing to dehydrate and what's your least favorite thing that you've ever dehydrated that you will never do again? I'm curious what those would be for you. Um, I'm just always fascinated by people and what they say. We took a poll in my dehydrating group um, that was, what was your least favorite thing that you've ever tried? Marshmallow, uh, watermelon was number one. Marshmallows was pretty close to that because even with the marshmallow rage, there are a lot of people who just don't understand how anybody could like them and really didn't like how they turned out. Um, but I'm curious what your favorites and what your least favorite again. See, Molly, you don't like the watermelons. Francis, you like doing the peas? Um, Let's see. Can you start onions and peppers out in a damp porch or garage, then move them indoors to cut down the smells? Cynthia, you can, but how damp it is will, will affect how it dries. When it's super humid outside, your machine is trying to move humid air from inside of it to outside. And if the moisture outside is at least the same as it is in your dehydrator or pretty close to it, that dehydrator can't move that moist air out. It's got nowhere to go. So you're going to be affecting your drying time a lot. If you're really wanting to worry about the smell and you don't mind doing this, sweat your onions a little bit before you dehydrate them. It takes out that, that strong, strong uh, smell when you're going to dehydrate them. It still will be a little strong, but it won't be anywhere near as strong. It's not the same thing as blanching them or fully cooking them like caramelized, but sweating them out a little bit will help a lot. Mushrooms and onions you love, Tina. What do you not love? Oh, Carol, you still have it in the box. I'm going to encourage you to get it out as soon as you can and give something a try. Ah, oh, thanks, Charlie. I appreciate that. You know, uh, commentary, uh, I won't do bananas ever again either. We don't like them. There's no point. Um, we don't like we don't like them at all. We would just prefer to go ahead and buy the commercials, commercial ones because we prefer those. We know they're fried, but uh, none of us were a fan of the, of no matter how many times I've tried bananas, we can't come to anything that we enjoy. So we don't do those. <clears throat> Let's see. We've got favorites of garlic and mushrooms, onions, bananas are also on that list of no, I didn't like bananas. Um, City girl, watermelon, um, don't, I would do watermelon that's in season. If you have in season watermelon, use it out of season watermelon often doesn't taste. And then you just got sugar. Um, if I don't, I'm not sure where you are. If you're in Australia, then go for it. If you're someplace in the uh, Southern hemisphere, then you're looking at them being ready. But, um, I would really do in season watermelon. Tina, if it was too chewy when you rehydrated, did you blanch your celery or cook it before you dehydrated it? Or did you do it straight? That will make the difference in how it comes out after. Um, Marilyn, why won't you do celery again? That's, that's a pretty easy one for me. So, but I know a lot of people don't like the way it comes out. So Dale, why won't you do onions again? They're one of my absolute favorites. Oh, city girl. Yeah, you can wait. Yeah. If, if you don't have an in-season watermelon, I would, yeah, it'd definitely wait. They'll, it'll taste better. Um, okay. So before we end of the night, um, I want to thank you all again for coming. I so appreciate it. This is my very first live ever. Um, it's actually turned out pretty well. And I hope that you've enjoyed your time here. Uh, don't forget the, it's available for $3 through tomorrow. And then it will go up to four whole dollars. Um, 
It's going to be, you know, this a big, huge jump of a third. But the Dehydrating Basics book, it's available on my website. There is a link down below. And in the comment section, I'm sure somebody will be dropping that for you. Um, it is basically the entire Dry Summer series that we've done every single day is in a, a printable format for you that you can print off from your computer or you can just have it on your e-device. Um, that way you've got this little handy dandy uh, book that you can find all the answers to your dehydrating questions. Most of them that I get asked all the time. Um, thank you very much, Lisa, for being a moderator tonight. I really appreciate it. So let's see those last questions that we have before we end it. Ellen Joy, um, I think I answered that question already about if you didn't see the download link that's available right after you pay for it on your completion page, email me at Darcy at the purposeful and I will get that for you. All right. Um, Tina, thanks so much. I'm so glad you enjoy it. It's been a great thing. Um, and Sandy, you're welcome. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Chris, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. And Annette, thank you too. Thank you, everybody. Um, Sherry, I might do more lives in the future. Um, this is just my first one to try. So I'm glad it turned out pretty well. Um, all right. So the last question before we go out. And we, I asked this in the very beginning before everybody got here, but I'll be curious. What is going to be your dehydrating resolution for the new year? A lot of us were to do more. So um, let's, let's hear what you are going to do for this new year. And thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate that you are here. Um, I have enjoyed this entire month. I hope you've learned a lot. I hope I've encouraged you to tackle some dehydrating problems that you had that kept you from dehydrating for your family. Um, I find this a really great means of stocking my pantry with food that my family will love, that we can have all the time that's shelf stable and not relying on keeping everything in the refrigerator. So I hope it's given you some encouragement that you've had questions answered for you. For those of you who don't know what dry December is, the link is down in the description box below. Low. It's 30 days of taking bite-sized chunks out of learning to dehydrate each day through each of the videos. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up because I, fe I feel the coughing thing starting to happen again, again and at the very end, uh, that way I can go get a drink. So thanks everybody so very much and I'll see you again next time.